Hey guys, this is Miso here with Miso Making It, and welcome to my kitchen. Yeah, today we're going to be doing turnip greens, and we're going to do the fresh guys. We're going to uh, go through the process of picking them, picking them, washing them, and cooking them. And so I'm going to be uh, preparing them for a meal, but I don't know what else I'm going to have with that meal yet in that meal yeah, but we know that we're gonna have turnip greens. So we're gonna get started and just make our turnip greens first since they probably are gonna take the longest to cook. So let's get cracking. So you see here, we've got our turnip greens and um, I guess this is about four pounds. Uh, I'm not real sure, four or five pounds I guess of, um, of turnip greens. Um, maybe a little less than five, but we have our turnip greens. They're really good looking greens, and it, it doesn't look like we're going to have much of a problem cleaning these greens, but like, we still have to clean them nonetheless, so let's go ahead and get started. We're going to just go ahead and run us some water in our sink, and we're going to be using just warm water, and I always put just a little bit of dishwashing liquid, not a lot, but a little. Uh, in my first wash and that dishwashing liquid will help to bring off any debris or any kind of if there's happen to be a little net or something on the greens it'll help to bring that off bring them off so I'm gonna go ahead this is the first wash and we're gonna wash them and then we're going to um, rinse them several times so we're gonna go ahead and get these greens right down in the water <coughs> excuse me making sure that um, the water is only warm. We don't want that water to be hot at all. So we want that water to be kind of tinted and want to just make sure that it, they don't, we don't want water so hot that it starts the cooking process on our greens. So, getting them all in the water. Everybody happy. Okay, so we can go ahead and get started. I'm going to just stop the other side of my sink up. Because this is going to be where we actually rinse the, the greens at. And get them down in here. And I'm going to go on and start with one while the sink is still filling up. I'm going to go ahead and start with uh, some of the greens that I can get to. We don't need, remember we talked about this before when we were cleaning, um, I think it was we were doing the collard greens that we were talking about before. We don't need these, uh, these stems in here. A lot of people, especially restaurants, they'll leave the stem in the um, green and that's just to stretch them and to make more, but we don't want to do that. We don't want to stretch them. This is just for our family, so we have enough greens, you know. So we don't want to, we don't need them. This actually makes it, doesn't, it, it detracts from the taste because these, these stems are, are chewy. And so we don't want to um, put those in our pot. So here I'm sort of unfocused because I'm really, uh, you know, thinking about my, uh, <laughs> about my greens and making sure that I'm washing them right. So let me just get a little bit more water in here. So I have a knife, but you don't have to always use your knife. You can just break it off. And the main thing is you just want to get water on every green. And this looks like you can turn them on the back. And you can actually break the spine out that way, which is probably easier. Um, the, the smaller the, the, the uh, turnip green is, then the more tender it's going to be. So that, um, that, that rib in the middle won't be as tough on a small one as it will be on a big one. And then, you know, I find that the rib is not as tough anyway, where on a on turnip greens, where you're going to really find the toughest at is um, on your collard greens. Now, let me get the water over here so I can begin to run water for the rinse. And it's going to be the same temperature. We're still going to just run that tepid, tepid water. And... Um, 
just enough. And so we'll be doing this, and this looks like probably if you say, gee, you're going one by one, this will take forever. But it really does not. I like cleaning greens because for me, it's therapeutic. It just, I just love to be able to sit down to a, uh, and I always, for this, I don't stand at my sink to do this. I always pull up a, a, a bar stool or something and, and a chair, and I um, sit down and do my, clean my greens, and I can just think and um, relax and enjoy myself. It's very, uh, very calming for me, very relaxing for me to actually uh, clean these greens this way. So you'll hear a lot of people refer to this as picking greens. So you'll have some strings like that that will hold on. You can, you don't have to break them off. It's you know, your choice if you want to. You'll hear people refer to picking greens. Um, in fact, the uh, old people used to say, that I'm gonna pick a mess of um, collard greens or turnip greens. And they would just call this a bunch, however much they were gonna cook. They would call it a mess <laughs> of collard greens or turnip greens. But they say picking because you go, you're picking up every leaf and you're going to pick through all of this and you're going to make sure nothing is on it. You're going to pick through them and make sure nothing is on it. And so this is why they refer to it as picking. You have to pick through them. If you had a bunch that had some bad ones, you would be picking through them to separate the bad, the good from the bad. So that's how we get the term picking through collard greens. Actually, it's just washing the collard greens. I'm sorry, I'm saying collard greens, but you know, as we started out, these are not collard greens, and you can tell by the look. They're not collard greens, they are um, uh, turnip greens. And um, I had someone to ask me once, let me turn that water off, I had somebody to ask me once, um, a younger woman, what was the difference between a collards and turnip greens? Because she had really not been raised eating either one of them. She had not had um, either one. Unfortunately, her mother was not living and had died when she was a young girl. And her mother, her father had raised her. And so he uh, mainly just, you know, fed her a lot of quick and fast food stuff because he really wasn't a cook. And she had never really experienced a greens until she became an adult and she would eat greens at other people's houses and she would, and she asked me uh, what was the difference between a collard green and a um, turnip green. Well, I don't really know the answer to that. I know they're in the same family. I don't know the answer except for the taste. And once you taste a collard green and then you taste um, a turnip green, you'll be able to know that there's a distinct difference in the taste. Now, the only way, short answer, I can say um, that the turnip green has a much more, um, can have a much more, I'll use bitter for the lack of a better word, um, sort of a bitter, you know, kind of a, bitter is not the right word, maybe sort of a hot, <laughs> spicy taste, maybe, let me say spicy. Where a collard is very, collard greens are very mild, and they don't have that at all. But the turnip greens have a little kick to them, a little bite, which I love. Now for me, I love when they're more, uh, the more kick that they have, the more spiciness they have, the more I love them. And um, they are, um, they are, collard greens are just a very, you know, very smooth tasting green, and you know, uh, kale has really become popular now. Where people are eating so much kale all everywhere, California and everywhere, and kale is the big thing now, the big to do. But you know, if you were raised in the South, you came up eating collard greens, turnip greens, mustard greens, kale, um, all kinds of greens. You know, you would have cabbage greens. You had all kinds of greens coming up in the South. So. Kale was nothing new to me, and when people started eating kale, I was like, you know, what's the big deal? And talking about kale, you know, all the cooking shows, they're using kale and talking about kale, but there's no big deal to kale. We've been having it all of our life. We've eaten kale, and I like kale. Kale is very good. In fact, if you really want to do something, you can make a mixture of your turnip greens, uh, mustard greens, 
um, kale. You can go ahead and get a bunch of each and just, just mix them. And that's really good too. You can have a mix. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Mix them all together and cook them together. And it's a very, you know, very, very good taste. But I think most people in the South probably already know about um, the kale and the collards and the, the turnip greens and uh, probably already are quite familiar with them. But you know, I do run into people that say they have never had greens before. Don't know how you made it without them. But these again, now these, if you, if you can think about it, if you remember seeing them, these turnip greens, these are the reason you call them turnip greens, is that is to distinguish them from the turnip root. There is a bulb that, at the, at, that is at the bottom of these greens. See, these greens have been cut. These, these bunches have been cut just above the bulb. And so in this case, they were selling the bulb and the um, green separately. And sometimes you can buy them and they're selling them all together. The, the greens and the bulbs come together. A whole bunch has the bulb hanging on it. And a lot of people don't like the turnip itself, the turnip. T-U-R-N-I-P, the turnip itself. It tastes sort of like a parsnip, um, kind of. The turnip is, uh, again, it's sort of a very, it has a very spicy, very distinct flavor. I love them. Uh, but my family, they don't, they don't care too much about them. But I love turnips. I can just buy turnips by themselves and just cook turnips and have them as a side dish. And a lot of people do that. But as I said, my family, eh, they don't really care for that. And so, um, now I'm just looking at this leaf. This leaf has just been kind of banged up a little bit. Maybe got caught. There was a, um, there was a tin tie around it. Might have got caught in that. But you see it looks kind of raggedy, but you, I can look at it and see these are not wormholes. This is just where it was, you know, sort of smashed by something else. Still going to use this leaf. Now, if you don't want to, you don't have to, because you see I have plenty of, of uh, uh, turnip greens here. So it's not like I have to strip on anything or just, you know, make do. I could throw it away, but there's nothing wrong with it. The only ones that I would throw away, if you could clearly see wormholes in them. Although I try to look at my greens before I buy them to make sure there are no wormholes, no mealybugs, and all that kind of jive on, on my greens because that, you know, when I see that, it's just not even worth it to, to, for me to even clean them. If I happen to get that kind of batch, I just go on and, and dump them, throw them in the trash. They're not that expensive because believe you me, the work you're going to have to put into them to get them right, uh, it's not worth it to me. It is just not worth it. And I never really trust that you ever really have it right because when you start talking about those mealybugs, they can just hide and it's just too difficult to, um, to, get, them, um, to get them off of the green. So, you know, my suggestion would be to scrap it and start over with some greens that you bought from a different location and anybody that I buy bad greens from, um, I don't buy anymore. You know, I don't... I, I, it's good to get a good place that you know has good vegetables and that they, they let, let them do the work of choosing the vendor that they get it from. Now, my green guy, uh, I have been getting my greens and, and lots of my vegetables and my cooking meat, that is my smoked turkey, uh, smoked, uh, smoked uh, neck bone. I don't really use smoked neck bone anymore, but I used to, but he has smoked neck bones. Uh, smoked turkey wings, turkey butts, which are which have more fat in them than the wing, and so they cook, they do really nicely. And um, the guy that I, the place that I get those from, it's a uh, like a vegetable stand. It has a little shelter over it, but I've been getting my greens from him for years. I don't even know how many years, maybe say 15 years or or more. But um, I like him because he goes. And he gets those vegetables like on, on, you go there on Saturday, like Saturday morning. He's already been to his vendors, and he, you know, they know him, and he's going to sample everything, and he's going to really look good at everything. And he know, they know that if they give him something that is not of good quality, uh, that he will, they'll hear about it again from him because he tries to get the best stuff that he can for his people. You kind of, you kind of know him like that. He. Um, he really, I don't care if it's watermelons or peaches or potatoes or whatever he's getting, he's going to make sure, because he's buying them in big lots, you know, he's going to make sure that he gets the very best. So usually the quality of his of the food 
is always good there and very fresh. Uh, just He's just bought it that morning and, and the uh, people, their farmers have come into the uh, farmer's market with the, with the food that morning also and it was just cut the evening before or the day before. And so it's very fresh. So I, I shop there, I do most of my vegetable shopping there and I used to live more close to, the, to where he is and now I have moved away. I don't live there that close anymore and um, I it's still it's a drive it's like a 40 minute drive you know, for me to get there now but I still and usually if I have the time and I can make it I'll try to get by there on a Saturday and uh, to still get Saturdays when you're going to find your best food there and I'll try to get there and, and Lord, a lot of people not just me a lot of people uh, uh, there, that place is, you know, it's really what I call a tight, tight to get in and park and get in there. And it's a small place, but it's usually buggy to buggy. <laughs> so many people are in there. And especially if it's like a holiday, say, um, it's going to be like a Saturday before Easter or something like that, or, you know, the day before Thanksgiving, that Wednesday before Thanksgiving, any, any you know, Christmas Eve or those days, oh my goodness. Lord, there's so many people there, but people are there to get that, um, those good fresh greens and vegetables, tomatoes and that kind of stuff, and they're also there to get the good cooking meat, because he has cooking meat of whatever kind you may want. If you want pork, he has the uh, pork uh, shanks the, that you can cook in your food. He has hog jowl, uh, which is pork, if you want to use that. He has, like I said, the turkey wings, turkey necks, turkey butts, they're smoked. And uh, I just usually go for the uh, turkey uh, wings and the turkey uh, butts. Uh, if you know, I usually get those. I don't hardly get any of that other um, pork. Uh, I think you call what do you call? I think you call them shanks. Am I saying the right thing? I think you call them pork shanks, uh, ham hocks. Uh, is that right? Ham hocks, I think, is what you call them. Um, but at any rate, you know, it's all good just depends on what you feel like eating what you want to do in your kitchen and I always remember that it's your kitchen and as a woman you're the one that really drives the um, the health aspect and um, the you know you kind of you kind of you know decide what the family is going to eat and so I you know I just kind of believe in all things in moderation I um, believe in the food being really good and tasty if I don't have to I don't want to spend too long toiling over it and uh, you know, I like to cut corners where I can, and also I like to save uh, calories where I can. A lot of the food that, I'm sh that I show you on here is uh, some of it's fattening, um, depending on how much and how often you eat it, but it can be fattening. But, you know, you can have anything sometimes as long as you don't have it all the time. So what I'm showing you, a lot of the dishes that I'm showing you, is just I'm showing them to you, but I know we don't eat like that in general every day and all the time. So, um... You know, just take what you put, take what you need from it. And if you need a, a a good recipe, especially a good home southern recipe, come to my channel and see what I got on here. What's available, and uh, I would love to be able to help you with some of your uh, cooking dilemmas. And uh, especially when you first start cooking, when you're new to the kitchen, uh, you have so many questions and so many, you know, so many things that um um. Just like the young lady that was asking me what's the difference between the collard green and the turnip green. And she was new to the kitchen. She was a young adult. And she hadn't had those things growing up, as I, as I said before. And she was just, you know, getting started cooking. She liked them and she wanted to get started cooking. Wanted to understand a little bit about them, you know, where they come from. Now, you know, I, I guess you all have her. And I'm going to do a video <laughs> about my pet peeves. This is one of them. I, I'm sure that most of you have heard, if you do any cooking at all, if you watch, if you watch the cooking channels, you've heard them, uh, you talk about using Vidalia onions, and um, they are an, actually a sweet onion. And again, we were raised on those onions. I never thought much about it. Uh, we were raised on those onions, and we do have other types of onions um, here. And, but we were just raised on Vidalia onions. That was the way to go. That's what you found the most of. So, um, 
I'd hear, you know, people, years ago, people that were just moving here, I would hear them comment on how sweet our onions were. And I'd be like, oh, really? And I never paid any attention. But anyway, the Vidalia onion has really caught on, and you'll see people of all walks of life and all these cooking shows using the Vidalia onion because it, it is a, oh, it is a deliciously sweet, very good onion. And, um, but one of my pet peeves is you hear people from other places like um, that, that pronouncing the Vidalia onion by pronouncing the word Vidalia and because they're using the onion. And people like, say, Bobby Flay, uh, who has just, he just insists on changing the name of the onion. He'll say, um, I think he calls it Vidalia, <laughs> Vidalia. It's spelled V-I-D-A-L-L-I-A. And it's pronounced Vidalia. Vi, it's not Vidalia. It's Vidalia. Um, emphasis on the first vowel I. Vi, vi long I, long I there. And uh, he, he'll say Vidalia and other people. And I'm like, okay, you don't have the right, sir, to uh, change the name of our onion. Our onion is named, is grown in a city called Vidalia, Vidalia, Georgia. And um, it is actually a place, and that's where those onions are grown. And um, those, I think the soil there, you know, um, is good for growing those onions in and maybe help make the onions sweet. But the city is named Vidalia. It's been around for forever. So um, I don't know why he's not comfortable with that. He's not the only one. I've heard a lot of people that they just don't know. They'll say, well, I don't know how to really pronounce it. I think it's... Vidalia, Vidalia, and maybe they think, well, because, you know, I don't know, because it's a, a, a southern name, I need to, it's going to sound prettier if I say uh, Vidalia, Vidalia, but it, it can't do it, can't do it, sorry, it comes from Vidalia, Georgia, and the name of the onion is Vidalia Onion, not Vidalia, anyway, I'll get that off my soapbox, now that's just one of my pet peeves, <laughs> and um, that, uh, you know, can't change the name of um, a place or a thing because it doesn't sound like you. Anyway, I'm gonna go ahead and get these um, these greens clean, and I'm gonna do that. Probably do the rest of them off camera. And um, the other thing is too. You see what I mean? When I am doing my greens, I'm washing them, and I, um, I'm washing them, and I'm um, sitting here. And it, that's when I get a chance to just think and um, uh, really just let my mind kind of wander to cares of the world, the day, and what I, you know, what I got going on and what I have going on. And, and but it's relaxing. It's not a stressful time at all. It's very relaxing. Otherwise, I wouldn't even thought of the little the Vidalia thing. But uh, Vidalia, Vidalia, really, we say Vidalia. Um, anyway, I'm gonna go ahead and get finish up with this. Get these done, and I'm going to come back just so that you can see us. I'm not going to actually show, um, I don't guess I'll show the rinsing, but I'm going to rinse these guys about four times, and then I'll start the cutting up process. So, we'll be back. Hey, YouTube. Just wanted to pop back in just to show you that even though these greens were some very good greens and not, you know, not a problem at all, not much dirt on them, not any, um, bugs or anything, but I just wanted to pop back and show you, even when they're good greens, that you do still have a lot of, or some dirt left over in your sink. So let me just see, can I ma uh, maximize this? So you see what you got left? You see that actual dirt that's in there? When I drain that water out from my first wash, this is what I had left. So just wanted to show you that. Don't be fooled because you don't see any, um, thing in there you know, it looks like on them it looks like oh they're pretty clean and these are pretty clean but you still gotta wash be back so now I'm just gonna go on and fill up this sink and I'm gonna begin to walk, rinse these uh, turnip greens from side to side so let me get my water going and we still want just tepid water um, just you know just look warm at this point you can use cold water in fact so we're gonna go on and begin to just swap, rinse these greens from sink to sink. We're gonna do it about. Guys, hold on to your hiney because I have speeded this up tremendously. So I hope you're not prone to motion sickness. But I wanted to show you this process without sitting through the whole ordeal. 
So I'm just rinsing this from sink to sink, and I'm gonna do it. I think I'm doing it four or five times here. But just make sure that there's nothing in the bottom of this thing. Just it comes back clean. You have no dirt, no residue, nothing. Do a little leaves, so that's okay. But no kind of dirt. Now again, here I have speeded things up, but I just want you to get an idea of how you chop up your greens and cut them. So really, I'm going to just call this a rough chop. You don't need to do it in any particular kind of fashion. Just chop through them, kind of just mound them together, and just give them a rough, rough chop, chop all the way through. We are about to get these down now into our slow cooker. Let's take a look at our ingredients. I have here some oregano. I have a lemon pepper, the onion powder, and my granulated garlic. And here I have some chopped bell pepper, the orange, the uh, red, and the green bell pepper. And here I have two quarts of water. This water is warm water. I have here that turkey butt or that turkey tail that I was telling you about. I'm going to be using one of those and that'll be enough to season our pot. I just wanted to show you this package. This is how they come. Mine are frozen here. And you see they say smoked turkey tails. You'll also see them say smoked turkey butt. But they have a smoky flavor and they'll really season our green very well. So here, let me get my slow cooker here. I'm going to get that turkey tail right down in there first. And let it be at the bottom. And I'm going to just start putting my greens in. And I'm pressing them down. I, it's okay to pack them in. In fact, you need to really pack them in. And I have a little bit of juice and leaves, residue left over. I'm, I'm going to get that down in the pot also. So now I am putting in my chopped up, finely chopped uh, bell peppers. And my lemon pepper, my onion powder, and my garlic powder. And I put in a teaspoon of each. Here I have my oregano, and I am putting in one teaspoon of oregano. This is a relatively really small amount of green. I'd use more if I had more green. So this is my um, eight cups, two quarts of water. I'm putting that in, and this is warm water, hot water so that it'll help to bring the temperature up in my crock pot more quickly. I'm using my wooden spatula to press it down. And here's my table salt. One tablespoon of table salt. So you see guys, I have this on low because in my, this case, I am going to be cooking my greens all night long. So it's the next morning here. Let's tip up on this pot. Getting real close. Let's take off this lid and see what's going on on the inside. You see it's still on low. I've left it there all night long. This has been about um, eight or nine hours. Let's check. Mmm. You can see. Do you see those bell peppers down in there? How good does that look? It smells even better. Now while you weren't looking, I went ahead and put a jalapeno pepper in it. I didn't pierce it or cut it in any way, so it's going to only give it a kick. It won't be hot. I've plated them up, guys. Look at this. I've also put some cornbread with it. Do you see the steam coming off of these guys? They are piping hot. I just picked this up. But look at them. They are tender. They are so good. They are colorful. And look at this. This is pot liquor. You've probably heard a lot about pot liquor. This is what this is, pot liquor. The juice that is in the pot, 
from the green. There's a lot of vitamins in that juice, so you don't want to throw it away. Mm. I want to taste these guys, but they are so hot, I'm afraid I'll burn my tongue while I'm trying to talk to you. Mm. This, this pot liquor is good. Don't sleep on it, guys. Your vitamins are in there. A lot of your vitamins come from the greens that go into that, into that pot liquor. Mmm. That's it. So, you see that I have my cornbread alongside. I, I made some cornbread, and I'll be uh, showing you how to do that on another video. But, ah, oh, man. You know, I'm just waiting to taste. I just want to taste it. This pot liquor, a long time ago, when people had small babies with no teeth, and they either couldn't afford, didn't have access to, or didn't want baby food, they would take that pot of liquor. You take the cornbread and put it in and just mash it up and they would feed that bit to their baby. Because remember, like I said, that's where the vitamins are. In the pot liquor. You didn't see any scrawny, dissatisfied babies. They were all fat and healthy and they loved it, guys. Guys, do this for your family. It's not hard at all. And you will love the taste. It's fresh. It's relatively low calorie. Your family will love it. It will be good for them. I couldn't eat this. You see me. I'm tasting. It's hot. Mm, but it is so, 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 so good. Thank you for coming by my channel. Guys, we subscribe. Subscribe. Subscribe to my channel. Come back and see me again so that every day you can see what I'm doing because you know I'm going to be slowing down, cooking something. Bye-bye.